thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, our weight-bearing cohort uh, experiences since 2010 in from Israel and Frederick Stroyer Department, where I am uh, a senior consultant and, and part-time heading the MSK research. And besides that, I'm also uh, consulting the Parker Institute and their PhD students within MSK research. So the outline of this would be just a brief overview of what we know from weight-bearing today to give you an idea of how little we, we actually know and then try with clinical cases to actually raise your interest in this to see the impact of what MRI in the weight-bearing condition can actually give you. We have to ask ourselves why upright weight-bearing MRI and looking at the spine being one of the uh, uh, areas of anatomies where you can actually have a benefit then you could actually say, what about stability and stability of the spine? Uh, it would be easier to actually address that in the weight-bearing condition. The genitive pathologies of the spine, what happens to the disc? How does it herniate? How does it change? Uh, is it mobile or not? Uh, we will learn that by having the supine and the weight-bearing as well. Then the spinal stenosis, which actually also is, is an important, especially the functional spinal stenosis. Uh, that is revealed when you stand up, even in young patients with a, with a thickened uh, <coughs> yellow ligament. And then all the 30 to 40 percent of patients that still have a failed back surgery syndrome, uh, why is that? Is that because you still have protruding disc material out in the uh, area of herniation? That's actually what you can use this scanner to visualize. Another thing we need to address is that uh, what can we have from the uh, weight-bearing condition. Well, there's something about the lordosis angle that will change. Uh, there's also the disc formation that will change or possibly change. There, there's some facet joints and what will happen with those from supine to weight-bearing. We need to understand that. And along with the facet joints and the yellow ligaments and the disc protrusion, we have some neuroforaminous uh, that, that also change. The recesses are also changing. The spinal canal diameter is also changing. And we need to understand all of these issues uh, in order to actually address <coughs> the patient's condition. So what does literature tell us about all these things? The lumbar lordosis angle, we have a few examples uh, uh, that in athletes, uh, normal athletes, you see a change from in the lordosis angle of around 8 degrees. Uh, you also have a paper here saying that if you have a backpack and you increase the load 20, 30 and 40 percent of the, of the person's weight, you increase the lordosis angle up to, uh, um, uh, uh, up to 8 degrees. And, and actually <coughs> The, it also increases the pain in these young school children. Even though it was a small study with only, I think it was nine participants from five to nine years of age, that's actually something that, that uh, uh, had significant impact on the understanding of these backpacks. Uh, but also, what also changed is that the scoliosis angle, it changed from 2% to 8% in the coronal plane. Uh, so that's, that is also something we need to to have in our head. It's not only anterior posterior we have the change, but it's also in the other planes, rotation as well. Another thing is that the facet joints, because they move, but also they, they have effusion. And it has been shown that effusion, it has a, a direct correlation with pain in the same matter as the modic type one change, which is the bone marrow lesion or the, the, water, the increased water contents in the subchondral bone. Uh, uh, also has, has a <coughs> correlation to pain. So, but, but what is actually, this paper says that the juxta facet cyst uh, is demasked or even increased when you have uh, a, a weight-bearing examination. So it will also help us to address why a patient may have increased local pain. It's like, well, this is like the uh, 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 public tail cyst coming out of a knee with effusion in. So it's, it's not different. So increased pressure will make the water go out in the, in the recesses, either posterior or in some cases even inside the, uh, the or extra spinal or extra dual here and give increased symptoms. So yes, the increased lordosis angle along with 
the disc bulging and the yellow ligament and the facet joint pathologies will decrease the area uh, of the recesses in the, when you go from supine to stand. Another one that, that was demasked is this uh, kind of uh, rare condition where you have uh, archolysis or non-fusion in other places than the usual place around L4, L5, S1. So, so this is a, a 543, uh, uh, L2-free condition. In the high field, you see that there's a non-fusion here, and you see the narrowing of the disc. And from the supine examination up here, you see there's an anteriostasis of, of around five millimeters, that it in, increases a little bit more on the, uh, on the weight bearing. But what you need to notice is what happens to the neurofarmal space here to there, and here to there in either side. It impinges more. So the nerve roots impinges on the, in, in the, in the uh, standing position. This patient was actually one of the first patients we had installing the system and it gave hope for more because she was a 39 year old female with constant low back pain, had been through a lot of clinical workup and specialty reports and they could provoke pain and she drew it around the knee. So it was a high lumbar uh, uh, nerve root irritation, but for, uh, a lot of the, the, the supine examination didn't show anything. But what we saw in the weight bearing was this mobile protrusion of the disc in a normal disc at the L2 root, irritating that. And this was really, uh, th this raises the question what to do with this? Because you, it's impossible to see these patients or actually to see the pathology in the supine position if you operate. So are we talking about here you need to fuse? Because that would be a solution, to fuse that segment. Uh, but, uh, but we are not there yet. And that's why we need the collaboration and the, uh, with, the, with the spine surgeons, as well as other uh, uh, rheumatological professors and so on, because we need to understand how to address this problem. It's, it's not solved yet. The patient now knows that they has the condition, but we have, we have not solved her condition yet, but we have visualized it, and now she got the pension. So, so that also means something that when you can objectify what the clinical examination can provoke, then there's a much higher chance, at least in our country, for the patients to, to actually get benefits and, the, and, and, and a pension uh, based on this. Another thing is the spinal stenosis, even in in, uh, in patients where you have the supine free tesla here, same similar change in the disc on the supine G scan, and in the an increased uh, change or uh, uh, cross sectional area, decreased cross sectional area in the standing position. And that is uh, also visible in the actual plane. You see here from a, a 0.8 centimeter. Uh, uh, distance of the dual sac, still with fluid around it, goes to less than uh, or around seven. Uh, but also, what you would see is that you have decreased volume of the recesses, mimicking a spinal stenosis. So it's, it's recess uh, uh, due to the hypertrophied uh, ligaments, yellow ligament, and the the uh, modified uh, facet joints you see that they narrow the, uh, the recesses and actually give spinal stenosis symptoms. So do we benefit from weight-bearing MRI? Uh, in my opinion, yes. Uh, we have a final stenosis rate that increases from 33% to more than 52%, and uh, this is in a group of symptomatic individuals. Then we know that focal posterior disc herniation is seen to enlarge or change configuration which is important to understand the patient condition. We have a more sensitive method for spinal stenosis, especially the functional spinal stenosis. And we have a more sensitive method for uh, hyperintensity stone lesion and how they actually change, as well as the uxtra articular facet joint uh, cysts uh, that are more pronouncedly seen or and changes in size and position in the weight bearing. Then the disc protrusion rate raises from 50% to 73% in a cohort of patients. So yes, we have a benefit from that uh, as well. 
Uh, and then the micro instability. It doesn't have to be much. It's only a few millimeters sh shift or rotation, and but it can be enough to provoke symptoms uh, for the patient. And being able to explain that and objectify it actually enhances the probability of the patient outcome. So find stable spondylostasis or the unstable ones, even the ones that with X-ray uh, or CT have been uh, classified as being stable. Is also an area where we need some more research. Thank you for your attention.